Hello ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to a brand new interview. Today we have the voice of Jasmine Jolene. We have Miss Siobhan Conroy. How are you doing today? I am wonderful. How are you? Thanks for having me. This is going to be fun. I sure as hell hope so. I mean, <laughs> it seems like we're going to get along just fine and I hope the fans enjoy this as well. So that's why we do it. I like your channel too. I like that. Uh, I really like a lot of your interviews and you make it so real and it's, you know, it just feels like you're talking to friends and it, that's all we're looking for in life anyway is human connections and friends. So I like your style. Well, thank you very much. And I like your work, whether it's the voice oh. acting in Bioshock itself, even though it was a little bit more of a minor role, even though it has more significance than some people actually realize. I've listened to a lot of your singing as well, so it's nice to have you on here. Oh, thank you very much. You are very thank welcome. So I guess, first of all, let's kind of go over a little bit of your background, how you got into acting, what made you get into acting and singing and overall entertainment in general, if you wouldn't mind well, sharing that story. Well, it's a long, crazy story, but I'm going to give you the Reader's Digest version. So my grandmother was one of 14 kids. So when we had family reunions, there were hundreds there. So I was two years old. All the relatives can verify this. I went into the bathroom. I got a commode plunger and I came out and put it in the middle of the living room. And I started singing songs like, I was born one morning when the sun didn't shine. I picked up, anyway, I started singing church songs and folk songs when I was two and three years old. And so, all of my relatives were just so appreciative and, you know, would pick me up and hug me and like, oh, we love your singing. And I think just because my family was so supportive, it, it kind of put me on this really fast trajectory to uh, be on stage and just enjoy the accolades. Um, but, you know, I sing to myself when no one's around to clap. I just love singing. Um, so fast forward to like when I was eight, I was playing my baritone ukulele. I was in New Orleans then, and I started a little singing group and we went around to all the classes and sang folk songs. This was a long time ago. Uh, and then uh, school was musical theater. And then a master's was musical theater, speech, English, and opera. So, you know, re you really need to learn how to sing uh, properly if you're going to go do it for any kind of longevity. Um, but then because I rushed, rushed, rushed through college, I started teaching college when I was 21. Um, I was just tired of doing what everyone expected. Like I was always the good girl. So then I toured the country for two years with a top 40 band and played like Marriott's and Hyatt Regencies. And so it was top 40 and some originals. And I did that for two years. Then I went to New York, I'm like, okay, if I can handle a whole bunch of drunks in bars, <laughs> I am ready to handle New York. And I'm a Southern Belle Texan. So I'm used to people being sweet. I'm used to, you know, easier, sweeter life where people talk to you in the grocery store. But after I did two years in bars, I was like, okay, I think I can handle aggressive New York now. So I'm going. Um, so moved to New York and started booking some cool things. Um, and, and you know, I, I left briefly to come to San Antonio. I opened up a theme park called Fiesta, Texas. Uh, it was part of the Opryland system. Uh, but then after a couple of years, went back to New York and then booked all my big stuff like, you know, Law and Order and Rescue Me and all my children. I sang on Letterman twice. Um, but as a singer, I also headlined at a lot of the big... Uh, venues like uh, the Ritz and the Hyatt Regency, the one that's, you know, got the glass elevators, the Marriott, the Marriott Marquis, um, and sang at tons and tons of LGBT benefits, raising money for AIDS and and homes where if gay kids get kicked out of their house, they have someplace spe special and safe and loving to go to. So raised thousands and thousands of dollars for all the LGBTQ um, um, causes. Uh, and then out of the blue, and I was doing a lot of uh, voiceovers. I was the voiceover for, uh, I was the voice of Ovaltine for years. I was the voice of Citracal. Um, I was spokesperson for Pitney Bowes and Bassett Furniture. And um, 
So you have done a lot of commercials, but then out of the blue, uh, my agent called and said, oh, I've got this interesting voiceover audition for a game. And my son had started gaming. So it really intrigued me. I thought, okay, <laughs> if I book this, I could probably be cool with my kids. <laughs> Cause you know, moms aren't cool. Oh, Even yeah, if they, they are, come on. <laughs> Everybody's well, got think... a cool mom. <laughs> I guess. I mean, I think I'm cool, but you know, my kids were like, yeah, yeah, mom's on TV, big whoop. It's, you know, so many people's parents are on TV in New York. It wasn't like, ooh, Bioshock, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so it's like, yeah, mom was on Law and Order last night, <sighs> whatever. <laughs> and my mom's famous. <laughs> yeah, big whoop. <laughs> you know, it was, I was raising kids. So I just did enough work to work constantly and be happy and fulfilled in the business. You know, so of course I was never famous, but I did enough where people stopped me on the subway and said, oh, I just saw you on the Jumbotron or Madison Square Garden. Could you sign my program? Like, okay, sure. <laughs> All right. That was kind of funny. Um, it must so be a anyway, cool feeling though, to like actually know, get recognized and like people taking time to, you know, say like hey i i know who you are i would think that would be so cool you know what that's funny you said that it was so cool if i was by myself but if i had my children with me the people would sometimes kind of knock into my kids to get to me and it made me realize it made me say a little prayer actually please don't ever make me famous just let me keep working constantly because i can't imagine a big star how they are chased around the streets and I don't know. So yes, it was very, very cool. And as a matter of fact, I started carrying a Sharpie in my purse because so many people were stopping for autographs uh, that, and they would frequently not have anything to write with. So I'm like, I got you, <laughs> you know, and I needed it anyway to mark my son's soccer gear. <laughs> so I'm like, just convenience. <laughs> I know soccer gear autographs okay i got you a sharpie right here <laughs> so um yeah so it was fun um so then my agent called and said i've got this game um you know they don't i think even back then they said we really don't know if it's going to make i think they were in the originally they didn't know if it's going to be cool so they were having some funding issues do you uh they, is had, this they had like a very low budget normally when a big game industry or game development studio has a game nowadays it's like a multi multi-million dollar budget back then i believe they only might have had like a million dollar budget tops so it was like oh. very bare minimum and wow. okay. at, at this time it was like this revolutionary game that really took aspects that were never seen and kind of tackled ideas that were only thought about so it was kind of taking a big risk and I think it paid off. That's so interesting. Uh, I'm not a gamer, so I'm kind of in awe of people like you who understand the nuances of the character development and the locations even and, and how you interact with the different, how you guide the storyline depending on what mm -hmm. you do. And I just think it's, it's such a fascinating arena that I don't know anything about. So hats off to you for having this knowledge because it is fascinating. And what I think is fascinating too is the friendships you make when you're playing online games. And like my son has friends in London and California and he's got friends that he actually interacts with and calls now because of the gaming. Yep. That's like a very, very amazing thing about just online culture as a whole. Uh, obviously, you get some bad things that come with it, but I think there's a lot more good that's done, whether it's like connections, making friends, acquaintances, mm -hmm. whatever. So it's, it's really nice. That's how I feel about social media. You know, you're going to have some bad people on there, but you have bad people at your school too. Exactly. But I think most of it is wonderful. Like I'm best friends with, uh, well, I'm now friends with my best friend when we were nine because of social media and a, a, a guy that we were in diapers together, <laughs> you know, we're friends on social media now. So it's, it's fun to find people, isn't it? Definitely.
especially yeah. when you guys can like click from being in two different places in the world. I think that's one of the most amazing things about it. I do too. Or like you lose your dog. I mean, you and I are dog people. Yes, very much so. So if you lose your dog, you go in next door and you're like, help. Uh, like Fluffy got out and immediately someone's going to say, I got Fluffy, yep. you know, it's wonderful. Yeah. We, we kind of, we live uh, just north of San Antonio. We're kind of in the boonies, but we can get to downtown in 15 minutes, but it's kind of rural. So we usually have a dog that runs up and down our fence and then we bring it in our fence and uh, we've got two acres fenced in and five humongous dogs we have 500 pounds of dogs jeez <laughs> it's crazy it's a lot of dog food um, i know <laughs> thank heaven for sam's club but yeah shout out to big box stores um but anyway just last night we had a chocolate lab in our yard and we contacted the owner and anyway yeah yeah anyway social media <laughs> gaming <laughs> there's a lot of good stuff that comes from it and uh people like you i never would have met you and i love your channel i think you're absolutely charming and uh you're a smart guy so it's it's fun well thank you that i really do appreciate that that means a lot well and the other uh bioshock super fan is the one who put us together alex lemus yep and because of him Oh, this is the crazy story. Besides what happened right before I auditioned for Bioshock, which I'll get to in a minute, I had no idea I did the voice of Jasmine Jolene until Alex Lemus contacted me through my website and uh, said, hey, you know, you're only credited for the baby carriage lady. And I said, well, you know, that gig was a long time ago. And then I moved home to Texas and then it won game of the year and you know, it's just, it was just another audition for me mm -hmm. because I'm not in that world. And, you know, my son was so young when he first started playing it, he wouldn't have recognized my crazy voice. Like I've never screamed at my children. So I'm screaming in this game. So he wouldn't even recognize that voice from me. Well, yeah, maybe, you know? maybe if you got mad enough, you'd recognize it. <laughs> I don't know. Um, so yeah, but so thanks to Jasmine, uh, thanks to Alex Lemus, I know I'm Jasmine Jolene. I know I'm that splicer in the bathroom. Um, the only one I could remember doing is the baby carriage lady because it was so bizarre and wonderful. Mm -hmm. um, and then um, I did one that said, I used to be beautiful. And it's not the, you promised me pretty, but it was another one. But, you know, in the entertainment world, a lot of times you do things and they get edited out. Yeah, a lot of, like, removed or cut content. It happened with yeah. that game as well. Uh, exactly. So it could be that You Promised Me Pretty was so much more fun than my I Used to Be Beautiful, you know, that they just went, oh, we're going with You Promised Me Pretty and You Used to Be Beautiful is like, <laughs> cut. So e Either that or no pun intended, but they might have spliced together different audios as well for that, too. Uh and made like uh -huh. a, an entire new but sentence. <laughs> but I mean, hey, I mean, it, it sounds familiar. And I, I remember hearing that. I don't know if it was one of like the flashbacks of like one of the ghosts. Maybe that's where they kind of slipped that audio in. But I'm not entirely 100% sure on that. It does sound familiar. Okay. Well, next time you play it or next time any of your fans uh, play it, you know, y'all let me know. So it's really cool. It's very cool. Um, so the craziest thing happened on the way to the audition. Um, I'm sitting in the car and all of a sudden the whole car, I hear boom, boom, boom. And it kind of rocks forward. And I look in my rear view mirror and it's a bicycle delivery guy sprawled out on my window and trunk. And if New Yorkers actually, well, we were at a red light. So people are jumping out of their trunk delivery vans and cars and they're like dude are you okay are you okay and i'm getting out of my car you all right are you right he's like yeah 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 you know most delivery guys are 22. this guy looked 60 and he had the big chain around him you know that they chain up their bikes with when they do their deliveries and he's like no dude dude i'm cool i'm good i'm good and he takes his bike part of a bike was on my car he takes that and he 
snakes his way through the traffic and we see him going down the sidewalk. So he wasn't hurt. So that was great. So I parked the car and I go up and um, the casting director said, well, wow, you, you know, you've got this confused look on your face. And, and I said, do I still? I got to tell you what just happened. <laughs> and so I told her um, the whole story and she said, well, I think that is an omen because this is a really weird script. <laughs> I mean, hey, it just prepared you for it then, I suppose, right? Everything happens for a reason. That's the truth. You hear about those method actors who, uh, you know, they want to study whatever in depth that they're playing a murderer. They're going to go interview murderers. Mm -hmm. and, uh, so that was definitely a weird thing to happen. Oh, uh, right. <laughs> your method acting is just a delivery guy crashing into your trunk. No big deal. <laughs> <laughs> he was a splicer. <laughs> ah! <laughs> oh, boy. I don't know. Anyway, I did the audition and I remember some of the baby carriage lines, but I remember screaming a lot. She's like, okay, can you sound like you're being killed? Can you <laughs> sound like someone's chasing you and you're worried? <laughs> and I'm like, sure. So I left that saying, okay, that was so fun. Oh my gosh. I have never done an audition like that before. Cause I was auditioning for Broadway and soap operas and, you know, never anything where I got to be crazy. <laughs> it seems like it would be kind of a nice break. It, it's like something new to venture into. Seriously a nice break. Yeah. And, you know, crazy can be fun. Yeah, I would say so. It's fun to <laughs> especially, like, slip into a character, too. Especially when you so. don't know the character. It's just you get to put your own spin on what you think the character should be and could be. Right. So that's the fun part about it. Yeah, making everything up. Seriously making everything up. So what's the craziest thing you ever did? Uh, <laughs> legal or illegal? <laughs> <laughs> well, if the statute of limitations is not run out, just tell me the legal thing. <laughs> we're, we're good with the illegal. Probably a lot of like trespassing and vandalization when I was younger. So that was always... Uh, don't recommend, but it was fun. It was really fun. <laughs> Jumping into swimming pools, you knew you weren't allowed in. And... Yeah. To say the <laughs> exactly. least, get the cops called a couple of times. No big deal. It's part of being in your <laughs> teens. <laughs> okay, how many times have you been handcuffed in the back of a cop car? <laughs> once. Just once. But I think that was, they wanted to more or less scare you. So, didn't, yeah. it didn't work. But my, my stepdad was a cop and, yeah, doesn't work. <laughs> yeah. It's <laughs> God. Was he a tough cop or a? Uh, yeah, yeah. Don't really like talking about him, but yeah, he was oh. bad. Let's just say that. Oh, I'm so sorry. Oh no, no, no. I it's it's okay. A... It is completely okay. I give you a virtual <laughs> mama hug right now. I appreciate that. Thank you. There you go. Because everybody needs mama hugs. That isn't that the truth, or <laughs> grandma, father, anything. Just. Just everybody oh, but, needs some sort of compassion. Oh, my gosh. I think we live for, you know, all the studies that if people aren't touched, you know, like old people, that they'll, they don't last as long as the older people that are hugged and given attention. And yeah, I'm all for hugs. It's a nice constantly. chemical boost. It's a nice boost of serotonin. I know, isn't it? And I have one friend, friend that hugs me and he can usually get a crack out of my back each time. <laughs> so that's fun. It's always nice to get a little back crack too. Oh, no. How did we? Uh, how did we go into this conversation? Um, it just makes so it anyway. more fun to not, you know, kind of stray <laughs> off topic from time to time. I think so too. I think so too. My gosh. So I love the pictures of your dog, by the way. That is a goofy dog. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Ken Levine also thought so as well because he had me I pr probably you've seen the interview I'm guessing but he had me it. actually bring her in and we were comparing dogs for like 20 minutes so I, yeah. I just I like when stuff like that can happen when it's like spare of the moment type things I know isn't it great you know when you edit this video you really need to put some pictures the goofy pictures that I've seen of your dog you need to edit in those pictures I got, I got you. I got you. I still have them saved on my phone too. 
oh my gosh, you need to do that. <laughs> that is one cute, silly dog. Yeah, yeah. She, she's a little broken. She'll army crawl from like the front room all the way to my room, and then she'll just flip over. So, and she was oh. a rescue as well. So I'm I'm glad that she took kindly to me. No, and you don't know what she's been through, but clearly she maybe she was a circus dog and talk, talk seems, to like it. <laughs> it seems like it seems like it she had to stay low pretty much <laughs> i love that she was in the trenches <laughs> of, i don't know who knows where that's funny um so let's say how did you know you actually got the role was it a long time after the audition or was it a little bit after like how much time did it take for you to finally realize that you're in this successful game you have a pretty important part in the story even though it's considered a minor role and yeah. just overall well, I, how was that experience for you the turnaround was pretty quick on this um i remember you know there was some i remember one audition it was just for a commercial for bassett furniture but I didn't hear for two or three weeks that I got the audition, and then I got the call back. And then two weeks after that, they called and said I booked the gig. And I was pregnant with my son, so my belly was getting bigger every day. And I was like, come on, come on, come on quick. I can't have a belly on this shoot. <laughs> but this one, I think, was a pretty quick turnaround, and there was no callback. So that's, that's interesting. Um, they just heard voices, and they liked them. But what was interesting is I didn't, I wasn't told uh, what parts I got. And I kind of think that they did that on purpose because Ken Levine is a very smart guy. And he was just very fluid with the whole process of recording the voices. Mm -hmm. um, so I heard I got the job and I was like, oh my gosh, this is so exciting. But keep in mind too, that none of us knew it was gonna be successful none of us knew it was a big deal um and i know apparently they recorded a lot of the voices in la um, i believe la and maybe boston or somewhere in massachusetts okay. as well i think you're right uh i know they did some of the graphics and everything in boston oh i got a crazy story about that in a minute um so anyway but i was in new york city um so I go to the studio and it's the craziest looking studio I've ever seen. Cause most studios are tiny little boxes that you stand in with the cans on, but, and they're kind of dark mm -hmm. uh, with a light for the script. This one was bright and pretty. And it was like two stories tall. It was crazy. And I go into the studio. And uh, so the control room is usually right in front of you, but now the control room is like, I don't know, 10 feet up. So the engineer's way up there and it's just me and the engineer. And so I put the cans on, I'm like, where's the microphone? And I look up and the microphone, is like four feet above my head. So that's crazy. You, microphone's usually right here yep. and you kind of eat the mic on certain, if you want to sound like this, you eat the mic. And if you're going to scream, you back off the mic. They did everything for me. It was, you didn't have to do any mic technique. It was fascinating. And I guess they knew there was going to be so much screaming anyway <laughs> that they wanted to put it really high. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, and to get all the uh, like reverb off the walls and stuff like that, too, I'm sure. Exactly. Yeah. Th yes, absolutely. So the, um, the tech person uh, said, okay, we're just waiting on the director. And all of a sudden, and he's across town. I thought he said across town. Now I'm wondering, was he in LA? I don't know. <laughs> we'll have to talk to Ken Levine and find out. Um, but anyway, so all of a sudden I hear, hey, you know, good afternoon. Thanks so much. I uh, really like your voices. And, um, and let's just go. And so I start doing, I think I did the baby carriage lady first. And he said, are you by chance a singer? And I said, yeah, if like a master's in opera and musical theater counts. Yeah, I'm a singer. And he goes, oh, good. But could you do a really bad version of Hush Little Baby? Do you know that song? <laughs> and, you know, that's a sweet song. It's a very sweet song um, that my mom sang to me when I was little. So I'm like, okay, this is a effed up character. I don't know if I'm allowed to say that word. Go for this it. <laughs> 
this is a this is a messed up character okay so she would sing it really demented um so anyway that's just when i was like you know baby don't say a word i was good about you and you're singing it through a revolver right but i'm singing it down here and i'm like okay the microphone's quick I'm sure they know what they're doing. <laughs> this is weird. <laughs> it's way up there. So I'm just kind of like down here by myself being brooding and miserable and dysfunctional. <laughs> ah, it's pretty funny. <laughs> I mean, it sounds like a good time. It was a very good time. <laughs> um, and then part of it was just, okay, we're going to do a lot of screaming now. Are you ready? I'm like, Sure, let me get a swig of water. Okay. <laughs> Probably got a lot of the anger out too that you built up. I, yeah, living in New York is a is a harsh reality, uh, or it was for me. Uh, so yeah, it was kind of fun to yell and pretend you're being attacked and pretend you're attacking people. You know, because that baby carriage lady, she turns into a demon. Yeah, especially once you take the pistol if you don't deal with her. She'll start like oh, throwing at uh, throwing stuff at you and freaking out. Right. Right. And um I, I sent you the link. There's another um Bioshock brilliant person that isolated all of my vocals for that. And I had no idea. I didn't remember that I did so many lines. Um but oh, you're gonna love this. You know what I caught recently? Hmm. I was listening to all the lines. And the baby carriage lady talks about the baby like she's a girl at first. And then she talks about the baby like it's a boy. And it kind of just shows like how her mind's kind of slipping in and out of reality too. Just right? like the small details of that is impressive. So impressive. So impressive because all of a sudden she's like, bad boy, bad, bad boy. I'm like, oh, wait a minute. You said I was a precious little girl early. You said the baby was a precious little girl earlier. And now you're... Oh, that ma- that so makes cool. me wonder if she's talking about the main character, too. I'm not sure. Oh. I mean, that would be a nice little detail as well, because at least they're addressing you, too, as the character. So either way, right. it's still impressive. Oh, my gosh. Okay, so all the Bioshock super fans, go listen to the isolated voices the isolated uh, lines of the baby carriage lady and figure it out because that's really i don't know if anybody has figured that out except for you and me right here so i'll try to do my best too i'll keep listening to it over and over and like see if i can put a context to that as well right oh that's so cool that's so cool so sorry about that we had some technical difficulties for whatever reason but uh, what would you want to ask again? Just so I'm aware. Yeah, I actually wanted to ask you. So when you first played it, and you were going into high school. That's really young. And uh, I was just wondering, were you scared? You played at a friend's house. Was your friend scared? Was everyone at school talking about how scared they were? Or <laughs> like, how did it not, go? Not really. It wasn't a scary game, more or less. It was more something to get your brain going, something to make you actually sit down and think about what the story was actually trying to tell you. Um, I've been playing games since I was like five. I started on like the original Sega and all of that. So if you're familiar with that console, but that's where I started and I was playing games like Mortal Kombat where you would like rip people's heads off. So a lot didn't really scare me up until that point. And I just thought it was a really fascinating game I haven't played anything like that up until that point so mm-hmm. definitely a lot of fun and I'm glad that my friend Logan actually introduced me to that series because without oh. that series I wouldn't be here in a sense so I, right. I did owe a lot to Mr. Levine and when we talked we actually talked after the interview as well and oh. it was just it was nice to be able to thank the person that was mainly responsible for that I love that. And I love that interview you did with him. He just seems like such a sweetheart. And, you know, you're both baseball fans. And I don't know, it was just a very sweet interview. It was definitely surreal, especially with that being the first interview that I actually conducted. 
So wait, that was your first one. Yeah. So going into it, uh, I deal with really, really severe anxiety. So maybe a week leading up to it, I was just nervous, having a lot of panic attacks and stuff like that. But thankfully, we were able to talk for about 15, 20 minutes before the interview, really calm the nerves, and everything just went smooth after that. So yeah. it was definitely nice, but it was definitely surreal to be able to talk to the person that essentially created the series. It was oh, it was awesome. Love, I love that. And I'm proud of you for fighting through your anxiety and panic attacks, too, because so so many young people have it, and you know. Some research says it's because the device is always in her hand and always in their hand. And so mm -hmm. they never have time to just let their brain go quiet. Yeah. And so, but I think most 20 somethings I know are on anti-anxiety meds. And so very proud of you for pushing through and doing that big, big interview. And, you know, you were so comfortable with him that I thought it was, way down the line I, I would never would have said that was your first one no that was surprisingly so, the first one i've ever conducted wow okay very impressed <laughs> thank very you proud. thank you as a mama very proud of you <laughs> well thank you i appreciate that that actually means a lot it was it was just scary to go into but that's okay yeah i bet and the more i do these the more comfortable it becomes it's almost like just second nature at this point it's like i said i just treat it like talking to a friend and it's always nice when it's reciprocated and everybody is just friendly with each other so it makes my job easier and i'm sure i hope it makes the guests feel more comfortable when they're doing interviews so that's what i aim for oh i love it and i'm i'm just having a blast and i'm just so honored that you asked me because it i didn't you know nobody realized it was going to be such a big deal and for it to be so impactful for my children also um I think my son was a little too young to play it when it came out. Uh, so, you know, I didn't let him play it originally, mm -hmm. but my daughter had just started college. So people would come up to her and say, I am so sorry. I had to kill your mother last night <laughs> because back then we just knew I did baby carriage lady, you know, and once you figure out the game, yeah, and especially the flashback scene with the main character, Jasmine Jolene. It kind of puts a lot of different things into perspective, and it actually has such a big impact on the overall storyline that I don't think people really realize that. No. Oh, my gosh, no. But it was it's kind of fun that this game gave my children street cred. You know, things you wouldn't think about. Um and then as soon as my son started gaming more heavily, he was on, you know, the Xbox Live. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he was a kid. His voice hadn't changed yet. And he'd go, yeah, yeah, okay, we're playing, playing. And then something would go on and he'd go, dude, dude, yeah. You know, uh, Bioshock? Yeah, you know, Baby Carriage Lady? Yeah, that's my mom. <laughs> and I would hear him go into this low, cool voice <laughs> to try to impress people. That's awesome, though. <laughs> that's awesome. Oh, sweet. And, you know, he would never tell me that, but I, I could hear him at the door and I'm like, oh, yay, I'm cool. <laughs> <laughs> um, so speaking of, you know, you being in other media, whether it's doing your singing and headlining like all of these venues, uh, you mentioned Law and Order, a couple of TV shows, commercials as well, and the overall recording of the game what did you find more enjoyable? What did you find easier to do? And have you ever thought about doing more like voiceover work in the future for games? Or is it kind of at the point where you're kind of putting that behind and focusing on something new? Uh, I don't think I've ever had more fun in my life than I did recording Bioshock. I, it was so much more fun than almost everything I did. Um, because TV is a whole lot of sit in your trailer and wait, and then you have to look perfect, and invariably you're in the makeup chair and your makeup's not finished yet, and the PA comes bursting into the makeup trailer and says, the director needs her now! And you're like, yeah! And, you know, it's, it's just so much fun to get into a, the studio in your pajama pants 
and you know bunny slippers and just give it 150 percent to the microphone you don't have to worry about what you look like you don't have to worry about did i turn this way to the camera did they, they get my good angle you know i've never had more fun than i had on bioshock so i would love to do tons more i would love it um so actually that's funny you said that because i am looking for a uh agent just for gaming because that's what i want to do um and even the commercials i mean it was so much fun to go in and do all the oval team spots and all the citric house spots i mean but voiceover is where it is it's so much fun i mean you know you're doing them now and it seems like it's so much more relaxed too because you can mess up without having to worry about getting someone pissed off and you have basically everything right in front of you and all you have to do is just read in a normal voice you don't have to act a certain way you don't have to have like a certain voice inflection unless you're like really trying to sell this product but right. other than that, it's just, it seems pretty straightforward. And that's what uh, I like you, about it. That, okay, that's a good point because you're in the studio by yourself usually. I mean, I did a game, I did a really cool audiobook uh, about a year ago. And there would be three of us in the studio kind of isolated and really doing our lines in real time, which was really fun. Um, but yeah, when you're on a set and you keep, you get, keep getting tongue tied over this one phrase, you know, the five actors around you might be needing to go to the bathroom or something and you're old or they're starving and it's almost lunch and now they're annoyed because they can't eat because you keep flooding your line. I think you just I think you made a really good point there about the immediacy of the voiceover work. I love it. Yeah, it seems like it's more urgent rather than like a voiceover where if you mess up once or twice, it's really not that big of a deal. So. It's not. It's not uh, the funny. One of the funniest phrases is subject to availability. And if you say it just subject to availability and they'll, the, the director will go, mm, we need you to do that in one second. And you have to smile or you can't say it. You have to go subject to availability. <laughs> so make anyway. it more, more professional. <laughs> there you go. So if you ever have to say subject to availability, get your lips out of the way. <laughs> it's your voiceover tip from me today take note Good. <laughs> uh, so I guess one of the final questions overall is are you at all connected with Bioshock fans have they actually contacted you whether it's Alex or myself uh, about your roles as Jasmine Jolene or even the baby carriage splicer has anybody like reached out for you for like autographs or anything like that yes absolutely uh for a while there i was getting a lot of autograph requests through my website or they would just google me and find me somehow um and that was really wonderful but then thanks to alex lamas and this only keep in mind what year are we in holy mackerel this only happened last year that i realized i was jasmine jolene as well and then of course i had to let everybody know that had been following me all these years. Oh my gosh. So, uh, and what's so cool is he gave me pictures. Now this is, can you see this? Yep. This is an audience. So I dressed like Jasmine Jolene tonight for you. You should have seen me before this hair was a mess. I was moving a hot tub. Well, thank you. Nobody I'm got... like I said, the fans are going to appreciate the dedication to the character. It's always Good, awesome. But you know, this is in the, this is in the, sh the game. This is amazing, an artist rendition. We'll have to get the artist credit. We'll have to find which artist did it because I absolutely love it. And of course, a still of the baby carriage lady. She's so messed up. <laughs> I just love it. Um, but yes, I love the fans. I'm very happy to send a headshot out. Um, and what I think is special about this is, you know, I, I don't have a huge following. I didn't have a humongous career. I had a nice, beautiful, steady career where I could still raise my children and still have time with them. Uh, I didn't have to be on a movie set for a month, you know, leaving my dogs and kids. Um, so I'm just so honored uh, to be recognized for this amazing historic game. Um, you know, I'm just 
a hardworking actor who's also a, a hands-on mama. And so it's really fun to be recognized and, um, and get to play somebody so glamorous. So that's pretty wonderful. And I thank you so much for including me in this world. No, I mean, exciting. thank you. You're the one that brought the character to life. So we should all be thanking you, honestly. Oh, thank you. It's pretty crazy. It's pretty crazy, pretty wonderful. And uh, so, um, I, so what's funny is when I told my son that I was uh, Jasmine Jolene, he goes, no, no, you're not. And of course I had to go write down some of the lines and say, well, if it isn't the long lost Andrew Ryan. And he goes, oh shit, that was <laughs> you. <laughs> I mean, I remember that scene and seeing that for the first time and it kind of clicking into my head what happened, but right. you, you going from kind of this like flirtatious, like erotic dancer, all of a sudden you go to the back room, you hear like another, uh, yeah, uh, yeah another set after that. Then you hear yes. the murder scene. It, it's crazy. You go from one emotion to another emotion to all of a sudden, like terror so very well done i i will say you that was very well done bumps. thank you you just gave me chill bumps by talking through that uh character progression because it's freaky she doesn't realize what she did i didn't know i didn't no no ah! yep. <laughs> like, ah! <laughs> and then just the audio diary that's next to her explaining what she did and i don't know if you remember that by the way it's more of like the character's backstory she uh, ended up getting pregnant with Andrew Ryan's baby and she sold the actual baby at, like the uh, like early stages. I guess she gave it to like the scientists and stuff like that. And right. they essentially grew the character. So it, it's a whole messed up situation, oh. but it, it was just really cool to find that out through the audio diaries. Oh yeah. So, but how fun. I mean, Oh, things that had never been done before in a game, we got to experience. Oh, one more crazy, crazy thing. So recording this was my last gig in New York before I moved back home to Texas. So um, the next New Year's Eve, I'm at a party and meeting people, really fun people. And uh, this gentleman and his wife were standing there and they said, oh, and what do you do? And I said, well, you know, I'm in educational sales now. Um, I've moved back home. I was in New York. I still sing at a lot of private events. Um, but I guess my biggest claim to fame is, uh, you know, with kids, our kids age, you know, people, our kids age, I was talking to them. They're about my age is that I did the voices for Bioshock and the guy, the man goes, you're kidding me. He said, my son who lives in Boston did some of the graphics for Bioshock. And so what are the odds of small that? world? very small world so here in san antonio there's two people with major bioshock connections so he takes out his phone and he texts his son you're not going to believe this i'm standing right here with the woman who did the baby voice <laughs> you know the baby carriage lady voice and his son's like no way tell her hi great job and i'm like well tell him hi great job on the graphics they're gorgeous yeah they're they were something else i would definitely say like even going back to the 20 uh 2007 release of it it still holds up graphically even though they remastered it in i believe 20 2016 2014 yeah. 2015 somewhere around there i don't right. remember exactly but it was somewhere in those three years and they made right. it look even better but it's it's crazy it's gorgeous and the only big thing i should tell you that i'm working on is i am producing my daughter's and husband's Broadway musical. And it That's is awesome. going to be a, you are going to love it. Uh, it's called Finding Helena and it's set in World War II and it is, it's a beautiful love story. And so that's the next big thing. So I'll call you and let you know how that's going. Do you have uh, any sort of like ballpark time frame as to when this is gonna be like finished with production and actually put up on stage? You know, it's always slower than you want it to be. And uh, I'm the queen of, uh, we can do it. We're the, I'm the Pollyanna, let's do it. 
Uh, so of course I'm like, hey, next Tonys, it's gonna be up for a Tony next year. Cause I think the Tonys were yesterday, but you know, I say a year, but we'll see. We'll see. We'll, we'll see. <laughs> and anyway, like, I'll keep the rest of it. And like you were saying earlier about you wanting to get into more like video game roles and stuff like that. I know the video game industry is like a multi, multi-billion dollar industry. So right. there should be no issues with you finding roles. You have no. all the talent in the world to do that. So just keep trying and I guarantee you, you'll get some roles. Thank you. You're, You're very everyone. sweet. I just want you to come over with your dog now so we can have a doggy play date. It might take a while to get to Texas. Only about like, I don't know, 30 hours. I'm up near <laughs> Chicago, so. Oh my gosh. I'm going to be in Chicago at the end of July. I might take a drive. For a convention, yes. Be nice to see you. Sure. It's not too far. No, it's about 30 minutes away. Oh my gosh, maybe we meet in person. Uh, that would actually be awesome. I would love um, that. That'd be really fun. All right, listen, you are charming and wonderful. And thank you so much for helping to bring together this wonderful community. It's because of you that it keeps, uh, it keeps like a family when we can talk about the characters and talk about who did them. and. And you're putting a face to these voices that have never had a face before. I mean, if it wasn't for you and people like Alex, I would not have known I did Jasmine and no one would have me credited anywhere really. So thank you. Thanks and so much. Again, thank you for coming on. One last final thing before we go, is there anything else that you would like to say to the fans, whether it's like a social media uh, website or anything like that? Anything you would like me to include in the video? Gosh, no. I just thank you so much. Thanks for uh, supporting it and thanks for making the gaming industry so fun and it's uh, such a family. It's pretty wonderful. Well, again, thank you so much for being on and we all appreciate yeah. what you did. So thank you so much. Thanks. Yay. Anyways, Talk to you later. thank you all so very much for watching the interview. We hope you enjoyed and again thank you for coming on we really appreciate it and with that being said take care stay safe and talk to you all soon bye everyone <laughs>